The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. Good afternoon and welcome again to the Veterans Forum. This program is coming to you from the TV studios here in Nashua, New Hampshire. Today is the 20th of January, 2016. And we've been doing this show here in New Hampshire the last five years, and we did it for about four years before down in Massachusetts. Everybody had the same story. We had a job to do, and we did it. Uh, basically, the format of the program is this. We're asking any and all guys and gals who served anywhere in any war or conflict, however you want to use the term, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Desert Storm, Desert Shield, whatever, if you can and will, grant us and the rest of the company a televised interview of your service and what it's done to, with, and for you and your family. That data will then be fed down to the Library of Congress's basic program called the Veterans History Project. It was instituted back in the year 2000, and we've continued every way through. The problem, though, uh, we're fighting the clock on the calendar. A lot of guys say, oh, yeah, it's a good idea. I'll do it tomorrow. Now, I'm not hanging crepe, but all of a sudden you recognize that uh, you may not have too many tomorrows, or tomorrow may never get here. And the problem is, if you don't tell your story, Nobody else will, and all that history, however it may be, is lost forever. Now, a lot of guys, older like me, I guess, you know, the grandkids, hey, Grandpa, uh, what did you do in the war? Well, for a while, it took me some time to kind of scramble. What war are you talking about? Because since the one I was in, World War II, a few of us left, uh, things have changed. There's a different attitude. And we're trying to make sure that the kids today have some appreciation of what it took to give them the lifestyle they have today, not hanging a flag and so forth. But uh, there's a cost to everything, and we want to make sure that everybody gets a fair shake. Before we start the program, though, I have to remind you of a new program that's instituted here in the state. It's a telephone system. The number is 211. Any guy and gal who served anywhere has had at least six months honorable service and an honorable discharge is entitled to the services. You call that number, or maybe some of your friends want to call it because you don't recognize, as they do, that you need some help. It'll put you in touch with a cadre of people and organizations that we feel will answer any questions you may have other than the next lottery number. But seriously, it's there to be had. You have to ask for it, though. But once you do, a lot of it will be well worth your time. Now, today we have another young fellow who's going to share some of the things that he did way back when, and we'll take it from there. Bob, I'd ask you, if you will, introduce yourself, spell out your last name, where you now live, the branches service, and your service dates, and we'll take it from there. Uh, my name is Bob Drake, uh, D-R-A-K-E. Um, I was in the Army 1984 to 1989. <clears throat> I live in uh, Litchfield, New Hampshire now where I run a, uh, a small farm, organic farm, a vegetable operation, and uh, what was the other question? Well, that's about it. Okay. This is what you're now doing. We just, well, it's a very scientific program. Take a picture of what you are right now, but then now, we go back, remember there's an old show, This Was Your Life, you ever see that? Yeah, well. well this is uh, going to be like that, only we don't have teachers coming back out of the wall. Vaguely, I remember that. Okay, so far <laughs> back, I know. Yeah. Seriously, though, let's go back. Like, where and when were you born? What was your family life like? Anybody in your family in the service other than you, uncles, brothers, or friends? How are you in school? What kind of a student? You know, what, we, what makes you? That's what I'm trying to find out. Uh... I was born in Weymouth, Massachusetts, and uh, when? In 1962, so they tell me, and uh, uh, 
pretty much a normal life growing up. You know, I went to school, graduated from Hanover High School in 1980. And uh, after that, where there actually were some jobs left in this country. Um, you sound bitter. Well, not so much, but there, there was a lot of manufacturing jobs back then, and it wasn't I know very. They're gone. It wasn't very. Uh, it wasn't very hard to find a job back then. Okay. So. Now, just back up a little bit. You, you glance all the way through your family life, your early life, your brothers and sisters, as normal. What was normal back then, and what kind of things did you do to keep active, out of trouble, or maybe that got you into trouble? Uh, it was just, um, you know, your normal. No, what does you know, normal mean? Well, it was just going to school and being brought up, and, uh, you know, I played football in high school. Okay. And, any other sports or activities? No. Were you a good student? Uh, I was, actually. Yeah. Um, good grades. And uh, I guess uh, college, never really even thought about it, you know, so. Why, because of money or you weren't interested? I just wasn't interested, you know, probably on the money side, too. So uh, That got me. I tell you, hit him in the wallet, they never, never forget you. Yeah, right. So. Okay. Now, after high school, would you, would you take a job someplace doing something? Yeah, I mean, there was a bunch of uh, machine shops and uh, uh, Globe Rubber Works in Rockland, Mass. And uh, uh, what else did I do? Um, yeah, I was actually a, uh, I made uh, plates for offsite printing presses for a certain company, actually, two different printing companies. And uh, where'd you get that kind of training? Or they just take you in and make you an apprentice? Yeah, they, they would bring you in and train you. Actually, you know, jobs are pretty good back then. Once you actually take people off the street and and uh, needed help, train them. Yeah. yeah. Or was it mechanically inclined, or you just did what came natural? How did you get your, the feel for it? Uh, it was definitely mechanically inclined. I mean, um, there was uh, you know negatives and prints and laying the stuff out on a plate and exposing the plates and having them developed and um, guys would come back with plates that need to be made over and I did that for... How did you make the plates? Was it an etching process or engraving? One was an etching process and one was a photographic uh, light exposure process. Can you explain them? So I, I have some idea but a lot of people here I know don't know what we're talking about. Uh, your simple, well, I'm not going to say simple, <laughs> but a plain English. short run type uh, one place was a place that I worked, and they, all they did was print book covers and jackets. So the book covers and jackets, you know, you'd be up to maybe 50, 60,000 um, wow. uh, book covers or jackets. So the plates um, didn't have to be uh, that high a quality as far as um, uh, the number of prints that it would put out. And it was actually cheaper on those ones to actually make a new plate other than ones that were etched with a copper finish on the end, which actually took an acid base to get this copper that was exposed on it, were good for millions of uh, prints, which were more expensive. And what are these plates? Are they, are they flat, aluminum, round? Yeah, just thin <laughs> aluminum sheets. <coughs> Why do you work them? What do you, I, I'm trying to get an idea of what the process is. <laughs> the process, depending on the size of the press, would be the size of the plate. Some were 40-inch plates, some were 28-inch plates. Plates of uh, what? Brass, plate. copper, plastic. Aluminum. Okay. Just I, a simple I'm aluminum. nosy. Yeah, yeah, sure. Just a simple aluminum plate. It had a coating on the top, a light-sensitive coating. Okay. And you had a light frame that you put it in, and then you had all your negatives that you would put, lay it all out. And the, the uh, books would be uh, the different, um, there'd be four or five of the same pay, or the same cover on the same plate. So you're getting five or six or eight or different um, uh, eight different uh, or eight um, covers on one plate, so it'd be eight times I'd be going through the press, and, okay. and uh, so yeah, it was pretty interesting. Now, are they all black and white, or color? Or do you have oh, yeah, it was, all we had four, five, and six color presses, so it was pretty. Uh, As you pretty think intense. about it, it's an awful lot of good work has to go in to, just to turn one crank to get a picture. Yeah, absolutely. Really? Yeah. That's what I'm interested in. I'm nosy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, how long did you do that? Uh, probably about two and a half to three years, and then I went to the service after that. Why did you go in the service? Were you just, bored or excited? Just looking for a change, yeah. Okay. Yeah. What, what branch did you choose and why? Uh, the Army and 
Don't know really why. Just walked in the recruiter's office and... That I'm all yours. Yeah, pretty much. you will take me. Yeah, yeah. Where did you do this? What town? town uh, I enlisted in Waltham, Mass, and went to the MEP station to take all the tests. I know they were calling it something else back. You know, ASTP or something? M MEPPS, the MEP station in Boston. Oh, okay. MEPS building, I guess. The, the, the acronyms. Yeah, right. Yeah, I don't know what I, I don't know what it stood for. Okay, stood what for, did so. they prove after the testings? What well, did they, they suggest they, you select from? Well, they said I scored high in bullet stopping, and uh, I wasn't really interested in that. So I kind of held out, and uh, I actually scored high enough in the test to be uh, uh, aircraft engine mechanic. Okay. And they showed me a bunch of things before that, as far as being a cook or an MP or infantry, and I said no. Oh. No, no. And finally, they came up with that, and that sounded pretty good. Okay. So. Now, was that fixed engine or? Ah, uh, turbine engines. Okay. Yeah. Where? Where'd they send you? Now, the question I ask all the guys, how did you feel the day you left civilian life and ended up the next morning in the service, in the next couple of weeks, boot camp? How did, what's your reaction to boot camp, your memories, good uh, or bad? Uh, it was good because um, I had no problem with somebody telling me what to do. So um, I took it on. I kind of like just melded right in. Some guys just didn't want to be there, and there was a dropout rate that was pretty good. I mean, some, some people just couldn't handle authority, and, well. and uh, they didn't last too long. So well, what, do you, what, do you, what did they do to invite you in to join the club as far as the kind of training that you got, the initial indoctrination programs? Did they give you a choice of, okay, these are the kinds of things you can be trained for, do, like, or we'll try to teach you about it. In boot camp? Yeah. I mean, uh, well, it wasn't boot camp, what they call it, basic training. Well, basic training was just basic training. You were just uh, there to learn how to be a soldier and handle a firearm and throw grenades and set up claymores, and, and that was it. So, and uh, after that, you went to, uh, uh, I went to T-School after that to learn how to fix T school meaning they call it T training school, uh, based in um, Norfolk, Virginia, Fort Eustis. We call it T school. Um, a technical school. Technical school, I guess you would say, to learn how to fix uh, turbine engines, and then from that point, I went to Fort Benning, Georgia, to uh, go through <laughs> jump school. Whoops. Wonder how did that come in the picture? Uh, you got to lead us slowly. Yeah, I didn't uh, even really know when I was at the MEP station, and they said, "Well, you're going to be, you can do a uh, 68B1P, which was the designator your MOS for aircraft power plant, power plant repair." And uh, the uh, enlistment officer there asked me if, uh, or told me that there was an airborne enlistment option with that. I was like, "Oh, really?" I was like, "Okay, sure, I'll take it." Had no idea what I was getting into. Not until about two months into basic training that I finally figured out that I was going to be going to jump school and learn how to jump out of planes. Okay. <laughs> a pretty good plane, and they kick your butt out. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That okay. Was, that was now, that. that's the part. Give us a kind of a one-day or two-day indoctrination as to how you felt when you heard that, and then what happens after that so that you can, we can grow with you as you developed. Um, well, I was surprised and actually very excited. So, um, couldn't wait to, to, to get there, and of course I had to go 17, 18 weeks or whatever the T-School was before I could get to that, so, um, and after that, it was just like, uh, what did I really get myself into here as far as jumping okay. out of planes, so. Now, how did you train for your first jump? Train for my first jump? Yep. No, it was like back to basic training for three weeks because it was like right oh, back. What basic training in jump school? It's different than the, the ground pounders, isn't it? Uh, not so much. I mean, yeah, you learn how to, you know, all the harnesses and hanging and, and all this other stuff, but it was still like basic training um, as far as, uh, uh, you know, get up, get down. You know, push-ups, this and that. There's always a stripe or two looking at you. Yeah, well, the the uh, instructors there, we called them black hats because they all wore uh, uh, black baseball caps. Oh. And they wore T-shirts on with a name on them. Their name or just? No, they wouldn't use their own names. Oh. 
No. Okay. Because you had everybody from an E1 to colonels going through that jump school. Some of these officers, you know, they've already been, free, been in for a while, and some, you know, uh, enlisted guys yelling at them and telling them what to do and this and that. You know, some of them don't really like it, so they never used their real name on their shirts just because there was no conflict of interest or anything like okay. that because everybody was the same in that school. It had to be because your life depended on it. Yeah, so it wasn't matter if you're E1 private or a, we had a couple full bird colonels okay. <laughs> going through that school in my class. Did they exemplify what the elite officer was able to do versus an EM or? No. No difference? No difference. None. Okay. You know, they might, they might put him <clears throat> as a stick leader or something like that. They had an officer, but that was about it. So. How'd you feel when they got you suited up, up the line? Up. I thought it was going to be a piece of cake. I had no fear and this and that. And it wasn't the first jump. It was the second jump oh. that actually I was completely terrified. Why, what was the transition? How did you it was just you didn't have any idea what was going to go. What was okay, going to... the first time was clean. The second time was a laundry job. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, Excuse my French. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, but after that, it got a little bit easier, and, and uh, um, I enjoyed it. A lot. Well, now you were qualified if you're a paratrooper as opposed to a grunt. Any differentiation? Any insignia changes? No, no. You just uh, wings. You get paid a little bit more. Yeah, I got yeah, fifty percent. That, that's good a good inducement. Jump, jump wings, and yeah. That was only like fifty-five bucks a month. Yeah, but when you only paid seventy, it's a good, it's a good yeah. piece of change. We actually did get that flipped around because officers got one hundred and ten dollars a month. Oh well. We actually got that changed, and it got, it was, we went uh, um, signing the petitions and doing all this kind of thing and had it all flipped around while I was in. So, and it was 110, board, 110 bucks across the board. Okay, good. For, for everybody. The same body going down. The same. Right, exactly. So, you know, we're all the same here. Yeah, we might be a different rank, but we're all uh, on the same hazardous duty pay. So, we should all be getting paid the same. Yeah. So, how many? Jumps you have to make a year to maintain status. Uh, that was four jumps a year. Okay. Three once every three months. You, know. you did a lot more jumps. I, I did a lot more jumps than. Okay. Uh, Let's go into some of that now. Um, when you were qualified and all that good stuff, did, did you have any other training you had to go through as farmers? Once you got down there, where you go? Your infantry training, if you will. When you landed, what was your assignments? Uh. It makes sense to ask a question like the, that. No, we were. It was kind of funny because we were in the aviation um, unit, and uh, I guess one of the good things was one of the good things one one of the good things was that uh, especially if we were jumping at night or anything like that, and you had infantry out there. You know, the 82nd Infantry was out there. And after we were done jumping, we got all the stuff together, assembled back to where we were. We would get on trucks and truck back to main post, which was 16 miles from the nearest, uh, from main post to the first drop zone was 16 miles. Well, the infantry, they walk back. Okay, you're lugging their gear too. You're lugging their gear and this and that. And oh, man. We used to go by and say, see ya. Yeah. We'll keep <laughs> gotta a go, light in the window. Got to go fix airplanes in the morning. <laughs> you know? So, you know, other than that, but we were all soldiers first. Okay. You know, so. What would you qualify with? 16 or 14? M16s, M14s, carbines? Uh, yeah, M16s, <clears throat> M60. We didn't have any M14s when I was in there, but I know who, what those are, the Garands. Or, uh, you know, grenade launchers and stuff like oh, that. How did you do? I did, I did very well. I mean, I scored 40-40 right, right out of basic training. I got two letters of commendation out of basic training for... Is that what you got here? Yeah. Okay, well, we've got some photographs here. I'd like to show you another... This is being your re-up, though. That's not. Yep. What are we talking about? Is this, is this one right here? Yeah. Which? The, okay. Oh, that's basic training for photograph, and they got a couple letters of commendation for uh, uh, hitting all my targets. Forty targets out of forty targets. They had forty good. targets, forty bullets, and I hit all the targets. Oh, good. And there was only two guys out of five hundred that did that. Wow. Um, had you so. had any prior experience before you went in hunting, oh, fishing, yeah. that kind yeah, of stuff? Yeah. So you, it's on, a rifle, it's on a rifle team in high school. Uh-huh. So. <laughs> okay. Kind of blindsided them, huh? Yeah, a little bit. But, but the uh, drill sergeant was really excited because, you know, 
the two guys that did it were in his platoon, so okay. he gets so the platoon PCA sergeants action. were all like, you know. Doesn't but, hurt your rep either, man. No, no. Okay. Yeah, so. All right, now, all this training and so forth, where and when did you get ready to go overseas? Uh, that was um, Fort Bragg and got called into the platoon sergeant's office and he had a bunch of paperwork in his hand and said, I got some good news and I got some bad news. Some of you are going to Korea, some of you are going to Germany. And I was like, huh? when do I leave? Because I was ready. Oh. Because that was enough. Jumping out of planes, it was just, I had enough of that. You know, jumping at night and this and that. And uh, it was kind of like, okay, because I don't want to spend it all. Well, that's why I home. asked before. Uh, <clears throat> if you had gone through old jump school and made all the jumps and qualified, what was your designation then? Were you a paratrooper or just a guy who jumps out of airplanes as opposed to the airborne? Uh, yeah, I mean, you were in the 82nd Combat Aviation Battalion, and uh, that whole battalion was were paratroopers. Okay. So... Okay, that's why I asked any difference in signals. Yep. Parachute or gliders or what have you. Yep, yep. Because everybody had their own little distinction. Right, right. Okay. Yep. Where were you headed to? Uh, after uh, Fort Bragg? Yeah. Yeah, Camp Humphreys, Korea. Okay. And, so uh, you got the good news? That yeah, was good news for me. Okay. Because I was excited to go somewhere else and there's no conflict going on at that time. So. How'd you get there? Fly or boat? We were flow. Okay. Yep. Any stops in between here and wherever you're Yeah, landed? what was it, from Fairbanks? North Carolina to St. Louis to Oakland, California to Nome, Alaska, I think. Okay, the up, upstairs. Then Hawaii, then Guam, then Japan, then Korea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a lot of countryside. Yeah. All, all green and blue. A few stops. Mount Fuji looked awesome from the sky, I'll tell you what, back then. Okay. Japan. Yes, were there. Yeah. Okay, now that you landed, what were your duties? What were your occupation? Uh, it was the same thing. Um, of course, you're not in the 82nd anymore, so I wasn't jumping out of planes anymore. But uh, it was the same thing as far as maintaining aircraft. And, uh, okay, now it just, you've lost me, but all right. Well, by my main job uh, at Fort Bragg was, you know, at the hangars, fixing aircraft, pulling engines. Okay, that was your main MOS. R this was right. Was there any training just for jumping or the, a special requirement? Yeah, I had to go through jump school to get the, the, the uh, to get on jump status, and then you're on jump status. Okay. Went right to the 82nd. So you had your comp other, other MOS. This maintenance is yours. Yeah. All right. But I had a... Uh, designator a 68B1P, which means parachutist, on the end. So you were eligible for hazardous duty pay, oh. or if you were crew chief or something like that, you get a little bit, bit of extra pay. Okay. But that status went away when they went to, uh, they called it a leg unit, where you were just walking around, mm -hmm. you know. Oh, the ant crawlers. <laughs> yeah, so. so, but it was pretty much the same thing. I mean, Korea was really good because we um, got a lot of experience. We could actually tear down the engines right down to bare bones. Um, we couldn't do that in the States. Um, they actually shipped all the engines to uh, Corpus Christi, Texas, Texas, where civilians actually did the complete teardowns. But it cost so much money for them to ship these engines back from Korea to the yeah, States. To to school, so we had, um, <clears throat> our unit was the uh, complete teardown of these engines, and we had a run cell and uh, build them back up, put them on a stand, hook all the lines up, push them down to the run cell, start the whole thing up and do all your checks and stuff like that. And then we put the green tag on it and send it back to the unit. Okay. It was good. Right so. enough, ready to go. Yeah. Now, so. you've got some shots here. I may be jumping the gun a bit, but um, of you and some of your crew, or you as part of a crew, can you explain? We got them keyed in, as you know, so that the guys in the control can talk about it. Yeah, this is uh, Mr. Yi. He was um, one of the mechanics that worked with us at the shop, and this was the main hangar. Uh, he was a Korean, right? Yeah, Korean guy. Great guy. They all were. And we're working on a, that one looks like a T-55 that goes into a Chinook helicopter. And there's a couple other cans lined up over here. Um, getting ready for uh, maintenance, and we had engines coming in and out of there so much, it was unbelievable. They did a lot of work there. Were they battle damage or just wear? 
Uh, wear, time change components. Um, okay. There was one that sucked up a bolt or something, Ooh. and uh, we brought that thing, put it in the stand, tipped it up, and watched all the guts just fall right out onto the floor. Is that the one that said "full cow"? Yeah, FOD kills. FOD kills. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> foreign object damage because those things can really suck up some air. I'll tell you. Yeah. So, yeah. and when even when I got there, there was two Blackhawks that were. One was pretty much in pieces. One was still intact. And I guess they had some accident, and they were in the hangar across the, across the flight line. I went and walked over there and checked out one of those, or both of those, and one was on a flatbed. And I guess they took off, and one guy nosed into the other guy's tail, tail rotor, and they both went down. Um, we had one particular E4 went down, <laughs> down into the village and got drunk came back on post and got on, got in a, a, a Black Hawk helicopter, started it up, actually got it off the ground, and bowled it over in the pond behind in our hangar. Mm. It took us four days to drag this helicopter out of, the, out of the pond in this hangar. I mean, there's some crazy stuff that went on over there. It was absolutely amazing. Some guys just, it was incredible. Uh -huh. So, last time I saw that guy, I saw him with two MPs on his arms and all. He didn't get really hurt. He got burned a little bit, I guess, and he had a bunch of bandages on him and this and that, and a bunch of us were standing at the snack bars. He goes walking by with an MP on each arm. We just looked at him and said, hey, out processing, are you? He was, just, <laughs> he was going to 4 Leavenworth or something. Yeah, <laughs> 20 and 20. Now, so, there's a couple here. Maybe I'm, I'm jumping the gun, but uh, looks like you are re-upping. Yeah, I re-enlisted while I was over in Korea. Okay, now what? any change in status no. as far as no it was it was, it was it was it was actually tough getting uh, through the 80s to the Graham Rudman cutbacks and the cutbacks were going in the military as far as getting promoted in, the, in aviation it was really tough i mean i spent 5 years in the army and never even made buck sergeant so wow yeah so. and you still on good behavior got a good conduct bar and all that good stuff oh yeah yep yep Nope, it was, uh, it was all promotion points. They had this point system. Oh, I know. Yeah, okay. So, uh, you tell the people so that you get some idea what you had to do to get a point. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you could do correspondence courses, this and that, and all kinds of other things. I mean, they, the cutoff for the promotion points was like nine ninety nine for aviation. You know, the guys that did move up in rank were more um, infantry guys moved up pretty quick and uh, stuff like that, so. Any reason why? Any reason why the grunts got up before you? I don't know. Maybe it was uh, more incentive for them to be uh, an infantryman, I guess. But I had no desire to be infantry whatsoever. So, you know. One thing I mentioned to do, and I got to, I, I got to get out of line here. But I'd like you to talk about that, if you will, and particularly the places that you were down there. Well, these were uh, drops. Tell people what it is, sir. Uh, this is my jump log <coughs> that uh, um, all my parachute jumps were recorded. And the first five jumps were at Friar Drop Zone in uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. And um, Sicily, Normandy, Salerno, and Holland. And um, these drop zones were named on Fort Bragg for all the places that were jumped over in World War II. Okay, that's what I wanted to get, make sure. Because yeah. with a uh, sister like that, Normandy, Dissy, uh, you'd have been a pretty busy boy. Yeah, right. Real busy. Yeah, but yeah. Those so, actually are just areas within Bragg. These are the drop zones named after okay. all the... Now, uh, they have any significance if you dropped it in Normandy? Could you go to Sicily or any different training? No. Different uh, Sicily was the biggest drop zone, so you could actually fly C-130s in there and actually land on the on the hard pack, uh -huh. um, so that was the biggest drop zone, and Holland was the smallest out of all of them. Oh, any one there that stands out as the one you had the best jump, the worst jump, the most memorable, you know, something out of the ordinary that brings a good memory? I just, uh, well, Sicily, I did have one jump where it was kind of rare to be the first one out. So I had a door position on, on one of these jumps. Okay. I can't remember exactly what it was. Green for go. So, yeah, I'm watching the green light, and I'm standing there, and, and uh, the jump master's there, and the green light go as well. You're the first one out, and uh, you're actually standing in that door looking out. Uh -huh. You have your hands on the outside of the aircraft, and you, you, 
if you're back in line, you're just going one right after the other, uh -huh. so you have no chance to actually you can't say no stand later. there. Mm -hmm. So you're standing there and you're waiting, and the wind is blowing, and <laughs> it's unbelievable. And that light comes on. I was like, okay, that was probably the best jump that I ever had, and I almost landed on a deuce and a half because it was at the very edge of the drop zone, and there were trucks lined up with all the okay. lights. It was a yeah. night nighttime jump, okay. and I landed about from here to that camera. Um, next to a deuce and a half, so you would have heard it if just, you hit it. Just missed it, yeah. 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 So other than that, now tell us the story about your second jump. Because you did the first one, there was no reaction. The second one. The second jump. Uh, well, the first jump because I was just learning how to do it, and um, there's a certain height, about 200 feet, where you pull your risers down to get your um, forward drift or whichever way you're going to down to about five miles an hour. Well, I didn't do that till about 50 feet. Oh, so yeah. I was doing about 10 to 15 miles an hour when I hit the ground That's on my fast. first jump. Yeah. So I went feet, hips, and head and went up and over and had the wind knocked out of me. Did and you would wrap up in the shrouds and all that? No, 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 no. It, was pretty, it wasn't all messed no up. No drag or anything? It was just a hard hit. Yeah. That's okay. all it was. And, and uh, then number two. And number two was like, completely terrified <laughs> at that point because of the first jump so but well, once I got things down and you know did the things the right way this time and every jump got a little bit easier after yeah. that so and actually actually it was a very enjoyable you have any well, there's nothing wrong with a little bit of fear you have to be smart to be you, you know a little not. bit of fear makes you think oh yeah I mean there was one guy in that uh, in our stick and he actually had the question to one of the jump masters um, he goes, if my main chute doesn't open, how long do I have till I pull my reserve parachute? Yeah. Jump master says, you got the rest of your life. And that was it. Okay. <laughs> Hell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Which God. is true, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. And I, from what I see in some of the packers, there's nobody ever brought back one that didn't open. Uh, no. no. You're right. But. All right. Now. How long were you there before you got discharged? Fort Bragg? Yeah, no, Korea. Tol what you do in Korea? Oh, I did, uh, did my year, and it ended up being about 14 months before I out-processed from there, and then I went to uh, Hunter Army Airfield, got attached to Hunter Army Airfield out of Fort Stewart, Georgia, and spent the rest of my time there. Any particular tra training or job uh, description? Or you just same, put in time? Same job. Okay, did you, did you feel any more comfortable doing it? Uh, I didn't really like it there that much because there were a limited AVOM unit, which meant uh, inter-AVOM or AVIM. It was just like very limited as far as what you could do on um, working on aircraft. Mm -hmm. It's like we couldn't even pull a motor out and put it back in. Everything was contracted out? Yeah, everything was contracted out. So my best experience was Korea. Um, you did what you were trained to do. Yeah, and Fort Bragg was actually um, a little bit better than the last unit that I was in. So a lot of times we did a lot of police call and uh, post police call and- uh, What does that mean? Post police call, you could put on that and go pick up cigarette butts all day <laughs> on post. Oh, oh, I thought you were some military cops or something. No, no, police call, police in the flight lines and this and that. And I mean, I did get my bus license and stuff and drove a few colonels around here and there, or people where they had to go. That doesn't but, hurt. No, no, it, was, it wasn't bad okay. at all. When so. they finally call it quits and they cash you out, where'd you come out of? Where'd you come home to? What I come home to, I went back to my job uh, making plates in the printing press um, industry, and uh, and I got back into the trades, back into framing houses, and I learned how to the whole. Um, Cabinet installations I did for over 20 years, installed kitchens in some of the biggest, fattest houses around Massachusetts, and and did that for over 20 years and finally made a change almost two years ago and I'm a full-time farmer. Okay, explain if you can the reason for changing. The reason Something for doing different or you just found a niche that you really wanted to do? Well, um, it's part of uh, being aware of what's going on with the GMOs and Monsanto and the poisons that they put on our foods now and um, I just wanted to make a change for because this is a completely organic farm, no genetically modified food, um, no growth hormones in our animals, no pesticides, no herbicides, nothing. So I want to 
uh, making a change that way as far right. as. You find it difficult to do it? Uh, it's just hard work. I love hard work. Okay, but you had to go any more schooling? For example, did you take no, any event as a GI Bill? No. Did you have a GI Bill? Yeah, I think there was, but I didn't have any interest in that. Okay. So, um, but I've always had a garden somewhere. I've always I've raised my own chickens for five <laughs> years and always had a small garden wherever I could have one, so that's always been an interest my whole life. Okay, and your yeah. present garden now, is that animal and vegetation? Or? Yeah, we raise chickens. Um, any livestock other than chickens? Pork, cattle, okay. um, grass-fed beef, pastured pork, pastured chicken, and we did lamb the past two years. So we do lamb also. We're thinking about doing lamb again this year. Oh. Is there any, uh, what's the best way to put it, dollar value one versus the other to sustain your, your project? Is uh, it a self-sustaining project? <clears throat> uh, we're getting to that point. We do have an angel investor, but um, it's getting a little bit better every year. I mean, when I first came in there, we had 33 full shares as far as people buying a share of the farm. This year, we went up to 50 shares. Right off of that, I think we're going to be up to about 80 shares this year. Now, what does a share give you? What is it just a certain share, amount of land or No, you're, you're buying a share of the farm and a share of the vegetables that are grown okay. on the farm. So uh, you have half shares and full shares, and people can, uh, because some people don't want as many vegetables out of the full share, so you can get a half share. So basically what they're doing is they're actually buying into um, the risk that a farm actually takes. So they're actually sharing in that, okay. you know, and they pay up front. And, and the um, act of participation, like a weekend hit, and then the hoeing and raking? Or uh, we do have volunteers dirty? that come down every now and then. Okay. Yep, yep, we'll, we'll absolutely um, have people, if they want to come oh, down and weed and down the road. help harvest or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. you maintain a farm stand during the summertime or the winter? Uh, we're actually looking into a place um, right on 3A, right down the street from the farm, uh, and start renting. And um, Steve Normanton, go to stevenormanton.com. That's the website you can check out. Um, all the information is there as far as ordering beef or you know, a side of beef or a side of pork or whatever you want. Um, and we're actually going to be renting some retail space. But... Right now, we just have a place set up on the farm itself. Where, and um, do you live on the farm or do you live exterior? I live, I actually do live on the farm. It is absolutely amazing. I can walk out my back door and, and you're home. go to and work. And at work. Yeah. 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 Now, how about your family life? Are you married? Do you have any kids and so forth? Or are you still a gay blade? Nope, I've never been married and uh, came close a couple times and I don't have any children. Okay. So, Whew. yeah. Good. I'm looking at the clock on the wall here. We're just about ready to wrap it up. Okay. It, despite what we've said and the new things you've introduced, any advice you want to give any of the kids today saying do or don't do as far as thinking about joining any of the services? You obviously say it has a bad effect on you at one hand, a good effect on you on the other. Uh, yeah. I, the, the whole world's changing. We're going through a whole paradigm shift now, and we cannot continue on the path that we're on with violence. Amen. So uh, things are really changing, things are really shifting, and I wouldn't recommend anybody going to the service other than um, keeping the peace, so to speak. Um, peacefully keeping the peace. Peacefully keeping the peace. I mean, there's nothing wrong with having a military but not being used for the wrong purposes. So uh, uh, just think twice when you're going, if you're thinking about going to the military, get attached to Mother Earth. Plant some seeds, um, get connected back to Mother Earth because Mother Earth is uh, not very happy. I know. And uh, she will cast off all evil at some point. If we don't do something about it, she's going to take care of it. Oh, yeah. Don't mess with Big Mama. Yeah. Okay. So uh, other than that, um, just uh, live a good, clean life and learn how to grow some good food. Because Amen. And... I do a good job of surrounding the stomach. <laughs> Love it. All right. Thank you for your showing. Thank you for your talk. You're welcome. Folks, that's a wrap, as they say. But before I sign off again, I ask you to remember 211 if you're in need of help. More important, check the address on the back here if you'd like to come and do an interview giving your side of the story. Bob Stevens saying thank you for listening. Stay healthy.
The preceding program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters.